Hi, my name is Chris, and I work in the research and development group at SideFX Software. And today we're going to talk about uh, USD assets, and more specifically about a new tool in Houdini 19 called the Component Builder. Before we get into the details of what the Component Builder is, um, we're going to do a quick start of how you can start using the Component Builder to generate reasonable, uh, functional USD assets. The goal of the Component Builder is to lower the barrier for artists or studios building USD assets, to give them something uh, without having to learn or implement a lot of USD pipeline or workflow. So the way that the Component Builder is used is here in LOPS, um, we just invoke it from the tab menu. Just type Component Builder, and there it is. And this puts down uh, nodes that will let us uh, set up the geometry and the materials uh, and then bundle them all together to give us a good USD asset, a component, which we'll talk a little bit more about that name uh, shortly. So the first step that any asset will need is geometry. So we'll come over here to this geometry, component geometry, and I have my parameters pane tucked away here. And the geometry is going to come from the SOP network that is embedded. So we'll just double click to dive inside. And you're presented with these three nodes and a bunch of stickies. We'll have, um, talk about these later when we, when, we, when we go into details about the component geometry. For now, we're just going to wire our geometry into this default output. So let's create a teapot, which is in the platonic solids SOP. Wire that here, and then change the type to Utah Teapot. We have our geometry. Next, let's go back up to LOPS and add some materials. So our teapot uh, renders, we could even switch over to Karma, and it'll just use a default material that, uh, that Karma provides. Uh, but we want to give it something a little bit more specific. So the component material node is a, a, a node for making material assignments within the component builder tool set. And the materials in this case are coming from the second input, which has a material library connected. So if we double click to dive inside, uh, we can create a material. Uh, you can create a preview surface. You could create one of the new standard surfaces, uh, the, the, the new standard surface that comes from material X support in Houdini 19, or you could pick a shader for the renderer that you happen to be using. Uh, in this case, I'm just going to use the standard surface. And so I'm going to give it a name. Actually, for our example, I'm going to just create a preview surface. So when we create this preview surface, out of the box, you'll see that our teapot turned gray. And that's because it is being assigned to our, uh, our model automatically. Let's give our material a good name, as we, as we should. And let's change the color to something blue. There we go. And hop back up to LOPS. Now, if we go to our component material, we'll see that uh, the reason why we're getting an assignment is these default expressions take the last uh, modified or the input prims from input zero, which is the geometry, and that resolves to the geoscope on our asset. And it takes the last modified or the last created material coming from the second input, which is our teapot material. And that gives us our blue teapot. Now to, to bring it all together, uh, we come down here to our component output, and you'll notice that if you look at the scene graph tree before and after, we go from having just a generic all caps asset to component output. And that's, that's an implementation, uh, that's a solution to simplify implementing these tools and, and all the things that they have to manage, uh, particularly in more complex uh, setups. So our, our, our next step to having a good asset is just to give it a name. So by default, it's reading the node name, uh, but we can just override it and call it teapot. So this has assembled a good USD asset. It's got geometry, it's got its materials, 
Um, there are some other features that we're going to break down here in a minute. Last thing to make this valid and usable outside of this Houdini session is to save it to disk. Now, in addition to saving to disk, uh, we might want to generate a thumbnail, particularly for use with the new asset gallery in Houdini 19. On the output, you can just hop down here and toggle on view thumbnail camera just to get a preview of what's what this uh, view is going to look like. Maybe we want to adjust it a little bit and then just hit generate thumbnail and that will snapshot this viewport and put it in a thumbnail image that's saved with the USD asset. When we write our asset out to disk, it's going to look something along these lines. So for our teapot, we've got a directory called teapot as well as the asset layer that, that has the same name. Um, it's got the .usd extension because it, is, it can be an ASCII or a binary file um, and we don't have to have to update our references to the asset if it changes between ASCII or binary. We also have our payload layer which references in the geometry and material layers and then the thumbnail that we also generate. So that is the, the component builder in a nutshell. We've, we've put some geometry together, added some materials, and this is a USD asset. So why do we keep calling it a component? Well, let's get into some of those details and understand why this matters and why it helps us when working with USD and working with Solaris. So the component builder is building a USD asset. And USD uses the term model when referring to publishable assets in general. And the reason for using model is a little bit of historical uh, because of uh, USD comes from Pixar and that's a term that they use. Uh, but it's also related to USD, this model kind metadata. So kind is a way of, of tagging or identifying primitives that beyond just their type or just their name or their namespace. And a kind can suggest what is this thing? What is this primitive? And a component is a model kind. We won't go into all the details of model kind, but it's good to use terminology that comes from USD wherever possible. It just reduces confusion. And so we're, we're incorporating using model and using component in the component builder tools uh, for that reason. So what is a component model? In addition to having this model kind metadata, um, models or components that, that come from the component builder are generally publishable assets that have a payload and have variants. They also inherit from a class primitive and they organize all of your contributions into layers, into files on disk. The reason why USD doesn't use the term file always for referring to a layer is layers can exist in memory or they can exist on disk. And LOPS is really good about letting you use the layers in memory as if they came from disk pretty transparently. So the component builder sets up our payloads for us. We can see payloads are primitives that have an orange uh, coloring here in the scene graph tree. If we unload viewports, we get a bounding box that represents the location and volume that these models are, are, are where they are in 3D space. Uh, we also have the class prim that they are inheriting from. We also have variants. In this case, there's just a material variant. Um, but we also have uh, nodes and tools support for a geometry variant as well. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about variants in, in, in a bit. And this gives us, this presents a USD asset for all intents and purposes. It's as the same as if a team of TDs had spent weeks and months building a tool for you. Um, but it comes in Solaris. It comes in with Houdini so that you don't necessarily have to understand what all of these concepts are in USD um, up front. You can just start building good USD assets and down the road as you build bigger worlds or you get more comfortable in USD, you might find these features, uh, find out about these features and want to use them. And ideally, you, if you're using the component builder, you'll have those uh, already set up for you and you can just start taking advantage of them. Now, what are these features look like in a real scene? Because obviously this is just a teapot and, and I'm just talking through what these concepts are. Well, to see them in action, let's hop over to the Animal Logics A-Lab. The A-Lab is an example scene, uh, a collection of assets and shots and, and lighting that show how Animal Logic has structured their shots and their, their pipeline within USD. They 
do a few things differently. The implementation details are different from what the component builder does, but the features and then functionality that the component builder provides is very similar or the same as what you get from the A-Lab setup. So if we dive inside, first we're not going to see anything, uh, and that's because we wanted to demonstrate uh, payloads. So if we go back over to our, our scene graph tree, you can see there's a few primitives, there's not a whole lot over here. Um, and that's just because I had the display flag down here at the bottom. But if we look at our sub layer, there's, there's nothing. Payloads, the whole point of payloads is that you, you unload them up front. And there are a couple of ways to do that in Solaris. One is you can uncheck load all payloads in the viewport, like we've already got here. The other is you can uncheck load payloads on the LOP node itself. And what this does is it actually unloads it from the stage in the viewport, or sorry, in the network view as well as the viewport. So if we home our scene here, you'll see that we've got a bunch of bounding boxes sitting in our world and a bunch of primitives down here in the scene graph tree. Now I'm, I've got the payloads unloaded in both locations, in both this, the viewport and over here. If you watch the descendants column, you'll see when I toggle this on and off, you'll see the number of primitives grows. So when we toggle on load payloads on the sublayer node, although our, our payloads are clearly unloaded in the viewport, by you know, signified by the, the bounding boxes, we see that more primitives are being loaded in the scene graph tree. And this is because the, we can decouple them to get a lot of performance out of not loading the heavy geometry in the viewport, but still having those primitives available within your scene. If you want even your the stage that all the nodes are working on to be as lightweight as possible, then you would also want to unload the payloads uh, on your sublayer nodes or on any digital assets that might be um, written that load shots, for example. Anybody doing shot work in reasonably heavy USD pipelines or workflows really should be uh, opening their shots without the payloads loaded. So how do we load payloads? Well, the easiest way in, in Solaris is you can come over here and hit S to get in the selection state and pick some of these components and you can right click in the viewport or in the scene graph tree and hit load payloads. And this gives us our models. Oops, focus on here on this chalkboard. And this lets us, uh, as we talked about before, load only the geometry that we want or need. One other uh, feature that the component builder provides that uh, we didn't talk about a lot, but we're going to get into detail shortly is purpose. And purpose is a way to designate which geometry is intended for GL preview and which is for uh, final render. So if we look at this model here, you can see it's very faceted. It's very simple geometry. Look at the wireframe that confirms that it's clearly been decimated. But if we flip our renderer over to Karma, we can see that we're getting full geometry. Solaris does make it easy to actually view the render purpose through the through GL by changing it to the the display options to uh, render purpose, uh, but generally we leave GL a preview and then let the, the path tracers do the full render purpose. These are payloads in action as well as purpose. If we look at our this at this model here, we can see that they have variants. Now the animal logic convention is to have a lot of variants in in their assets. Not all of them have data in them, but their their workflow is to give every model these variant selection options, even if they have nothing uh, in them. A really neat thing to do with the A-Lab is to look at how they implement everything and to take the time to read the excellent documentation that they have online, because you can see different ways to implement and get to uh, features. There's, there's always trade-offs in building USD assets, and the component builder doesn't claim to be the be-all end-all, and neither does the A-Lab. You know, Animal Logic is not putting it out to say, this is the best way, but is a way. It is a way that is used in production. And so comparing and contrasting is good to see what may be better in some cases versus others. It's also really good for just understanding USD and seeing USD uh, in action. The last thing that we'll take a look at are inherits and how those can be used in a, in a scene. And to do that, we'll, we'll drop down here. We've got some bottles. I'm going to select them and load these payloads. And all of these bottles are inheriting from a primitive. Technically, I believe that in, in the A-Lab assets, they're specializing, but for the purposes of this demonstration, um, the 
result would be the same. So the way inherits works is the primitives are inheriting or looking at a particular prim path. And any opinions that are found at that namespace, at that location, will get added to itself. It will inherit from them. Technically, the ALAB assets are specializing, uh, but for our demonstration, you'll get the same result uh, in this case. So the way we can see this in action is if we have a, a sphere being added to the inherited location, uh, all of the bottles are getting the sphere. You'll notice that this path is just one location. It's only creating one sphere. But because each of these bottles, which are instanceable on top of all of uh, on top of everything, because they're inheriting from this location, they get the sphere. And it just gets added to the instances. We don't have to do any special magic to de-instance and edit those uh, models. So this is a, obviously a simple example, but you can imagine you could do more. You could add and adjust materials on these bottles. You could add some piece of geometry. You could even add a variant. Uh, some of these things will require tooling to make simpler in Solaris or may require tooling for your specific workflows, um, but the underlying mechanisms are are there. And that's what the component builder provides. So although the structures and the implementation details are different between the component builder and the ALAB from Animal Logic, the features and functionality are largely the same. So now that we've looked at what the component builder is making and, and looking at some of those features in action, uh, let's dive a little bit deeper into each of the parts of the component builder tool set uh, to understand what they're doing. So to do that, we're going to come over to this uh, setup of some mugs and rocks uh, to break down what each of the nodes are doing. To start, the, we'll look at a pretty typical component builder setup, very similar to what we did in the quick start a few minutes ago. And let's start by breaking down the component geometry node. As we saw earlier, um, it has a dive target. If we double click and look inside, uh, we can see that there are some outputs available here. And the nodes that represent that the nodes here represent uh, different purposes. The default output is just a regular output. It doesn't do anything different. And if we look over here at the scene graph tree, we can see that under our geoscope, we have uh, our geometry and the subsets, just as you'd expect. But if we connect to proxy, you'll see that things have changed a little bit. We now have a proxy and a render scope beneath the geometry. And these scopes represent the display purposes for our asset. And they are automatically handled whenever there are both the default and proxy connections. If we disconnect proxy, then we're back to just having a default purpose, which will just show the same geometry regardless of the render delegate. There's a third output over here, sim proxy. And all this does is generate a scope uh, and relationship to uh, use within Solaris with the edit lop or the drop lop or other kind of physics enabled tools within Solaris. Um, but uh, it, this is just to simplify setting up your assets for that rather than letting the tools regenerate uh, the collision geometry on the fly. Um, this is a way to get some, get some performance and uh, out of those tools. So this is the inside of the component geometry. Otherwise, it's a fairly standard SOP network. All of the same rules apply when using the SOP import LOP of converting uh, SOP geometry into LOPs. So you can use name attributes to, to name different primitives, or in this case, uh, we'll look at the parameters, but you can set up geometry subsets from primitive groups, which if we come over here and display, uh, we can see those same prim groups here that correspond to the geom subsets. Um, and so you can just use pretty much any uh, SOP tools that you might have. Now, here I'm loading from disk with a file SOP, uh, but the component geometry also has a way to load from file here at the top. You'll see our, our cup looks a little jaggedy uh, because it's displaying the proxy purpose. Again, we can go to final render and see that, see our, our nice mug. Um, but the component geometry, in addition to the internal SOP, it'll let you actually load files directly from disk and skipping the file SOP version, as well as an external SOP. If you've got a SOP network that's up in OBJ or located elsewhere in your HIP file, you can just point at those. The file SOP is, is useful, 
uh, probably in more mostly in procedural cases of processing large numbers of files and assets. Um, even if you are loading from disk, I highly recommend just uh, using the internal SOP so that you have the opportunity to generate your proxies using custom tools or just built-in tools uh, in Houdini uh, so that it looks the way you'd, you'd expect. Um, again, if you've got an external process that is, excuse me, an external process that is setting up these files for you, then you can just use these directly. Uh, for example, in, in, a, in a top graph, for instance. Uh, if we look down the list of parameters on the component geometry, uh, again, very similar to the SOP import because they're, they're using the same perimeter, parameters. Um, we've got attributes um, that and uh, parameters of, to specify how to convert SOP attributes into USD. Um, we've also got controls for uh, what the packed primitives should look like once it converted to USD, whether they should be native instances or point instances. Uh, as well as height field controls. Um, and then in the advanced tab, we won't go into all of these details, but uh, this sets up the name for our variants, which we'll go into geometry variants a little later, um, as well as some other uh, features for adding custom data or uh, colors based on the models for the draw mode uh, that, that comes with model kind. This is the, the component geometry node. It's pretty straightforward, not a whole lot of a special um, special sauce here. It's if you, if you're very comfortable with the SOP import uh, workflows, or you're used to using the SOP create, uh, this should be a, a much uh, a very similar experience, and and probably an easier experience to uh, for artists uh, compared to the SOP creates because it streamlines and and takes away a lot of the other options and features just to give you a, a focused set of parameters. Next, we're going to take a look at the component material node. Uh, this digital asset is a, a largely a wrapper around the assigned material lop. Uh, what it gives you is a, a very streamlined interface. Uh, the advanced tab does let you untoggle uh, the simple interface to give you some of the more uh, some of the other binding options from assigned material. Uh, but generally, the simple interface should be enough. There's also a parameter to uh, control how the materials come in from the second input, whether you just want to copy them as is, flatten any references, or only copy the ones that you need. Uh, and and no, nothing that is unassigned will, will get added in here. Uh, but for the most part, the simple interface, just using it as is, is going to work almost almost every time. Now, the source of our, of our materials is the second input. And the input can come from a material library, or you can reference them in from a, from a location on disk. Uh, this reference method is going to be more handy when you have a, a USD authored material library. And in this case, we're using uh, some examples that come from Material X, uh, but the concept is the same whether you reference materials in or you author them in a VOPnet uh, from scratch. The materials come in through the second input and can be applied uh, with this node. Now, these default uh, expressions may or may not work once you start adding in additional nodes out of the box. Nothing's really broken. You just need to specify a material. So if we wanted to give them uh, this tiled wood material and then assign it to, uh, right now it's assigned to just the geometry scope. And we won't see it because it's a material X material. But I can flip over to Karma, and the wood comes through. Um, or we could assign this orange plastic that we generated manually and see that. Now, right now, we're just assigning it to the whole geometry via the geoscope. Uh, but we have geom subsets. So we could assign a different material to the different base sets, so, so to speak, of the meshes. And so let's grab the rim and the handle, and let's make those orange. And then... Let's add a second material assignment. And in this case, we will leave it at geo and give it a copper shader. And if we switch over to Karma, here we can see our, our material assignments. This node is doing material assignments largely, but it's also making a material variant. 
the material variant is specified here. So the name of the variant set as well as the name. Um, and it just defaults to the name of the primitive. Um, it's important to know that the materials that come in from the second input are not exclusive to this node, to this material variant. If I come down here to the copper one, the copper material variant, or excuse me, to the copper component material node, that's a tongue twister, uh, you'll see that copper is used exclusively across the whole mesh. And that's because the material assignments are part of the variant, but not the materials themselves. So I can still, uh, even though the name wouldn't match up anymore, I could use the car paint shader. And this is all still available to me in these different materials, in, to these different material variants. I can dive in to these nodes, and if we needed to add a new UV set or paint some prim bars, I can do that. And any edits within the component materials dive target, within this, this editable area, is exclusive to the variant. It won't be available to these other nodes. Uh, but this just, this just gives you um, a, a focused place and location for uh, authoring to a component variant. Try to simplify uh, what that looks like. Geometry variants are also implemented in the component builder. And they, but they are done in a, in a slightly different way. So to get a geometry variant, we use a component geometry variants node. And what this does is, is it's a multi-input node and every input becomes a new geometry variant. By default, uh, if you'll recall, the advanced tab on the component geometry node has a geovariant name. And so by default, each of these variants is just the name of the input node. Um, you can also override this name with a prefix or override it completely on the geometry variant node itself. And to, to see these geometry variants in action a little more clearly, let's, let's move over here to the right um, where we've got a mug for, uh, we have five mug variants. So right now, this we have the current variant set to mug A. By default, the, the current, quote unquote, or the set variant is just the last one connected. But if we wanted to pick a different one, uh, we could do that here. Uh, we'll leave it on mug A for now. So we've got our geometry variants. And then these, these material variants that are being layered on top apply to all of the geometry variants. Uh, this is really neat uh, because if you've got geometry variants that may differ uh, in appearance or maybe in some, uh, uh, some small areas, like they might have different point counts, but the primitive paths are all the same. Uh, you can assign these materials to the, the primitive location and regardless of the variant, it will have that, that material available. Come down here to uh, the bottom of our graph uh, where we've added not only our five geometry variants, but our five material variants. And the explore variants lop will lay those out for us. So now we can see each geometry variant, A, 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 see those five A variants, has one of each material variant. And so now we've got these 25 uh, possibilities. You can see with not a lot of nodes, you can get a, a pretty high degree of variation. Uh, we haven't even authored shaders that use primvars to get even more subtle variety to each to each instance. Um, and even without that, we still get a really great variety of, of looks uh, just with uh, our five geometry variants and five material variants. Now, the geometry variants node does let you very easily, uh, not only can you do geometry specific edits in lops, you can also add uh, geometry variant specific materials. What that looks like is is over here on the right. So it's it's a very similar setup as as we were just looking at with our five geometry variants. But instead of the material variants following our component geometry node, exist here in uh, here within the geometry variants. So mug A only has this car paint, and mug B only has a brass material. And so when we explore our variants, instead of having 25, 
uh, like we did before, we only have five because we've only got five geometry variants. They each have their own material. So we're not making any, uh, we're not iterating through any material variants, but we are seeing the different materials per geo variant. These component materials, they are still authoring their material variant. It's, it's a nested variant within the geo variants. So technically you could have multiple component materials within each geometry variant. That might be useful in a case where some of the geometry variants have five different material variants, variations, and some of them might only have one or two. Um, so you could add multiple of these in here if you needed to. Um, obviously specifying different materials, but, but you get the idea of what it would look like uh, in, the, in the network. The two variants. So these are the two variant sets the Component Builder presents and, and makes easy to author and to, to work with. Um, obviously, variants are extremely flexible. One of the things that often paralyzes artists or studios is deciding what to call a variant and how many variants should we have and should it be used for LOD? Is it not LOD? And the Component Builder can answer all those questions for you it gives you a geometry and a material variant out of the box that you can use however you want. You could use them for LOD or you could use them for, like we are with the mugs, uh, just as, as appearance alternatives without necessarily getting stuck trying to make the right decision ahead of time. In addition to our nope, our input style of, of geometry variants, we can also use a for each loop in LOPS to make variants. So if you wanted to generate, for example, rocks, uh, let's come down here to our explore variants and the rocks are just a bunch of rocks. They aren't uh, necessarily hand modeled. They're, they're coming from some procedural system. And so we can use a for each loop. And in this case, I've renamed the, uh, the context option to rock num and we can use rock num in our nodes. So here we're setting the, we're overriding the variant name to be, to use the rock num uh, context option. We're also adding a prim var, which our shader is, is using. And if we dive inside of our component geometry node, uh, we'll see that some of our randomization SOPs are using rock num as their offset or their seed. And so by using a for each loop, we can generate uh, a bunch of variants uh, procedurally and use the explore variants to see them all in action, whether it's only two or three, or whether it's 33. Uh, we can see that the loop simplifies generating a bunch of procedural uh, assets. This isn't always going to be possible, um, but being Houdini, uh, generating procedural or partially procedural assets is second nature. And so the, the component builder allows for you to use the for each uh, to, to do that procedurally. So this pretty much covers variants as they are expressed and supported in the component builder tool set. Now, the last step, this, this component output node, we, there's a lot going on here because this is the node that brings it all together. And so now we're going to dive into the component output. All right, so the last big part of the Component Builder tool set is the Component Output node. And by default, this node is set up to read your asset as if it was assembled using the Component Geometry, Component Material, and other Component Builder nodes. The root prim is by default just the name of the node, but we can give it any name. This is, this is the, the, the root primitive, the thing that will be referenced uh, when anybody or any tool references this, this model into their scene. We can also set the kind. Now you might be asking yourself, well, why do we have this menu if there's only one? Well, model kind can be easily extended uh, in USD. And this may be more common in the future, uh, but you can make specific kinds of component kinds. Uh, I know we're using the ki word kind a lot, but you can base a kind off of an existing one. So you could have, for example, prop or cloth, or excuse me, cloth or so for example, you could have prop or garment or hair. Uh, those could all be uh, specific components that might exist in your scene. So this menu will pick, should pick those up once those are those custom kinds are added. Uh, we've also got uh, a folder here for set in the default variant. 
And by default variant, it just makes a variant selection so that when referencing the asset in from disk, this is what you get out of the box. You don't have to do anything extra and you'll just see it. Uh, next in the advanced section, um, this controls additional metadata that you can add to the root prim. Primarily it's related to asset info of describing what kind of asset you have. You can also uh, do some fun things like uh, for the Houdini scene graph tree, you might want to have a special icon apart from the default one that comes with the component kind. You can do that as well just to make it easier to find uh, certain assets uh, within your scene. You can also add more custom data. For example, if you've got geometry that you need to attribute to another artist or entity, uh, you can add that here as well. The caching folder is largely uh, very familiar if, if you've written out geometry from from Houdini with a geometry ROP or a USD ROP. It also has like the file SOP and other similar nodes. It has a toggle to load from disk once it's written out. We also have options for uh, if you want the name of the file to be slightly different. Um, you can do that, but generally it follows the same name as the as the root prim. Um, the layers that are set up, um, they're named here. So there's the payload layer, geometry material, and then this extra layer. The extra layer is uh, actually a dive target that the component output has. If you wanted to add more opinions in their own layer, uh, for example, lighting would be a pretty uh, common one. You can do that here. And then these will end up in the extra layer if, if, there is, if there are any contents. On the topic of the layers that the component output is generating, this diagram uh, illustrates uh, those layers and how they are composed together. Uh, the asset layer uh, payloads the payload layer, which in turn references the geometry material and extras layers, uh, which are ordered from weakest to strongest. You can name these layers, obviously, to something different. The extra one probably is the most frequent layer that you would rename to make it obvious. So if I've, if I've come in here and I've added um, a light for our mug, uh, we would want, uh, we, would, we would probably want that layer to be indicative of, of its contents. So we could just call it LGT or light or whatever. Um, or you can just leave it at extras if it doesn't really matter. But this kind of gives you a, a curated, just in time, last, you know, last thing on the way out the door. Uh, a location where you can make some edits and layer them into to your asset. Variant layers, uh, we're going to talk about this in a, uh, we're going to demonstrate this more shortly, but this outputs a USD layer or USD file and thumbnail for each variant by default geometry variants. Um, and this is primarily for convenience of working with the asset gallery. Uh, we're going to demonstrate this shortly. And then these are standard uh, USD ROP parameters and features for adding context options at render time or layer metadata, etc. So if we hop down to the thumbnail folder, uh, we touched on this briefly in the quick start section, but I wanted to talk a little bit more about it uh, in detail. So this view thumbnail camera, again, temporarily adds the thumbnail camera to the scene and you have controls to frame your, your model. There are different modes. So you could render out uh, in the background using GL or a render delegate such as Karma or RenderMan or Arnold or 3 Delight, et cetera. You can also auto-generate on export. And what this means is anytime that you click save to disk, it will regenerate the thumbnail for you. Um, you can change the resolution if you need a lower or higher res uh, thumbnail. You can also load a, a thumbnail from disk with the file option. The option I wanna uh, talk a little more about and want to revisit is this viewport mode. Uh, because what it's doing is, is on the surface, it looks like it's just taking a, a flipbook, a single frame flipbook. But really, it's just taking the thumbnail from whatever the viewport is showing. Currently, it's GL. But if we switch it to Karma, where we've got our, our rendered mug, um, it's going to just use this, this, uh, uh, this setup and these settings uh, for our thumbnail. And what this means is that we can get a very, um, you know, a nice looking render uh, based on what we're seeing in the viewport without having to wait a ton of extra time. We can just kind of frame it, set up our, our camera, and hit generate thumbnail, and it will output to disk uh, our image from the viewport. So let's go back to our, our uh, variant layers option, and to take a look at that more closely, let's go back to our, our rocks over here, if you'll recall these, these procedurally generated rocks. 
By default, when you look at the asset gallery, it's an entry per asset. The variant layers lets you add an entry per variant so that uh, when you pull in this, this selection choice from the gallery, uh, it will have the variant uh, set for you. So just for uh, convenience to a smaller number, convenience for recording, um, and come down to our component output. And if we toggle on variant layers, and then it will output to disk our uh, USD layers and thumbnails. When it's finished, you will get a variance directory that has a USD layer and a thumbnail per variant. Okay, and now it's done. And if we look at the files on disk, uh, we can see that our uh, rock for each asset um, has a variance folder. So these are the, the layers that get authored by default. And inside we now have this variance folder that has a thumbnail for each variant. We have this add to assets gallery button that we used before to add our blue teapot. If we have the variant layers toggled on and if those are written to disk, when we click add to asset gallery, this will actually add each of those variant layers as well to our gallery pane here. And once that process finishes, there we have it. We have all of the rock variants that we generated. So this is the component output. Um, it's designed to take everything from the component geometry nodes, your component geometry variants and component materials and combine them into a fully featured, ready to use USD asset. These assets can be used both from disk or live from the component output node uh, equally. And the way that looks is with the reference, LOP, you can reference from the multi-input, and that references this anonymous layer in memory. Um, you can also read it from disk, like this. Oops, let me save that to disk. And now this reference is actually going to pull it in from disk uh, and not just the anonymous layer. Um, you can also use the new asset reference LOP, which uh, can bring in assets from the second input or from a file. Uh, but the nice thing about this node is it combines uh, transform and variant selections uh, in the same location. Tangentially, this asset reference node is used by the test geometry tools, which previously were just SOP creates. Uh, but now, when you, when you invoke these tools, it actually uses an asset reference and loads in a USD cache from disk. This is obviously most... Uh, pronounced this, the difference is most pronounced with this crag because the animation before was much slower because on every frame it was reconverting to USD. Uh, however, now we're just referencing in the animation and we also have a, a rest or animated pose for crag. Um, this asset reference just bundles three very common operations when when doing layout of referencing, transforming, and variant selections uh, all into one place. So now that we, we reference our asset in, a very common request is how do I get a per variant or per variant prototype when instancing? Because if you look closely, we've got a lot of mugs, but they're all the same mug. There's no parameters here that say, uh, you know, parameter or prototype per variant. The way to do that is to use the explore variants lock, which has had some, some tweaks and optimizations made under the hood. Now the explore variants uh, doesn't do any time dependencies and it doesn't author the transforms in a way that, that uh, would sometimes cause problems with instancing setups. So now we have a per geometry variant uh, for our mug, you can see here. And if we go to our instancer and change the path to this, we might have to kick it to, to reload the viewer, um, we've got a per variant prototype. And Explore Variants makes this really easy because even if we added a few more geometry variants, We'll just have to reload and refresh this instancer and we get it. The one thing that to, to keep in mind when using this explore variants to use your geometry variants or other variation variants that you've, you've uh, added with the component builder is you'll want to turn off only copy specified prototype primitives. So that's how you can get uh, per variant prototypes very quickly uh, in Houdini 19. Now back to the component output. Uh, the sources for our, our component outputs are almost always going to be component builder nodes, the component geometry, component geometry variants, and component materials. Uh, however, we have a couple of other options here. 
uh, input primitives or scene import. So to look at those, uh, uh, we'll take a look at the alternative sources network. Here we've got uh, the input primitive source, which literally just takes your input primitives and by default just dumps them all into a payload layer and then that gets payloaded into the asset file, into the asset layer. Uh, you can see this reflected in the export options because now we only have two layers. The extra layer, which is you know still there as a dive target on the output node, but the payload layer is just everything that comes in by default. The component output is not designed to handle every possible asset style or, or possibility. However, we wanted to open up the door for um, experimentation. And if you are experimenting with different ways of structuring your assets that are, that are different from the way the component builder works, you can still use this component output node as your hook or anchor for your asset. Um, but you just set it to component to input primitive source and then you can kind of do whatever you want, structure things however you need to. Um, you can even go as far as unloading or unchecking this payload input primitives and set up class uh, class for inherits. And really all this is doing is making the asset layer for you and providing a, a ROP output and thumbnail generation uh, services. And this is really, really not doing very much at this point. Um, but again, it lets you experiment with different uh, styles of, of structuring assets uh, without necessarily having to rip out all of the nodes that you were using or write a component output equivalent yourself. The other source that we allow for is the scene import. And you do that by setting your scene import to uh, as the source. And then on your scene import node itself, what you'll need to do is on the, the materials, you want to make sure that those end up as children to the, to the model print. So by default, this is generally what the, the, the scene import does is it will put the materials in their own uh, namespace, their own path. It does this because the scene import isn't guaranteed, you know, it could be bringing in hundreds of objects. And so those materials uh, need to live in a common, uh, a common location. However, the, the component output, when you're bringing in from the scene import, it can only process one object at a time. And so uh, to, to make things work, when output through the component output node, you'll want the destination path to be the same, uh, at least have the same parent primitive uh, as the rest of the geometry. In this case, it would just be squab. We would also recommend to, to put it under a material scope just to organize it. And then one last step that will help clean up your paths, because you can see there's obj, squab, test geometry, squab, etc., coming from the object nodes, it's just flatten the hierarchy. And that'll just dump those materials under your material scope and this looks very similar to what you would get out of the component geometry and component material nodes, but it's coming from scene import. And then component output will take the payloads and materials that come from the scene import and organize them in the layers uh, for output to disk. And now you have a component, an, an asset that you can build coming from scene import. Uh, some cases that you might want to use this apart from just, you know, I have assets that I built in uh, in obj that I want to bring in and run through the component builder, um, you may also be bringing in assets that, you know, from FBX and you're processing them in, in obj or elsewhere in your hip file. And you can use a scene import to, to bring in that FBX asset uh, here and, uh, and process that process it through component output. All right. The last segment to our class of in the component builder is we're going to, to walk through a uh, basic scaffolding setup of the component output in uh, being used to kind of structure an asset uh, and all the layers manually. Uh, this isn't going to be a working example per se, uh, but it, it does show how you can structure the, the LOP network to see what, uh, to see how you would use the component output uh, in the context of prototyping or developing a new asset structure. So to look at that, let's hop up over here to this LOP network. Uh, and you can see, let me expand uh, my, my view here. And you can see that we've got um, a, bunch of, a bunch of LOP nodes laid out for us already. And so what, what's going on here is this is actually structured very roughly. There are no variants in here specifically, uh, but this is structured very roughly in the simplest component builder case where we've got um, a geometry layer 
a material layer and an extras layer that are being all referenced together. Um, the, these layers are uh, what the component builder sets up. And in this case, we're, we're kind of replicating it. But you could try different things. You could, you could see what it looks like when you sublayer all these things. You could try different variants and all, all of that. The layer breaks, if, if you're not familiar, are, are important for uh, ensuring that these opinions are overs or overlaying or layerable based on this input. Uh, and likewise for this, uh, this extra section. Um, down here, we've got an extent, a set extents hint uh, node that will author the extents hints on your, on your primitives. Um, these configure layers are crucial because they let you, they, they set up the anonymous layers such that when the ROP runs, they will get written to disk uh, in an expected path and with expected names. Um, these reference nodes uh, need to be set to reference from multi-input uh, for this to work. And once that's the case, then these, these will just reference together the same as if they were written to disk. Uh, and then similarly, this configure layer is for the payload, which when it is set to payload from multi-input, uh, payloads are, are geometry in. And then these last nodes, this is where we set up, um, we loft the payload extents out, uh, above the payload arc so that unloaded payloads draw their bounds. Um, here we set up our, our component kind on the root primitive as well as asset info or, or other options. And you'll see that a lot of these are, are very similar to what we saw on the other nodes, uh, excuse me, on the component geometry nodes. Um, that's because they are using almost all of these nodes to build up uh, the, the workflow for you and just curating what gets, what gets promoted up. These last two nodes set up the class primitives uh, as well as the inherits that comes from the class primitive. Uh, class prims in USD are what's called a specifier, which just means it's a it's a way of authoring the primitive into a USD file or into a layer. Normally, when you make a primitive, you define it, which is what a def define is. And overs are when you're overlaying opinions, um, which are meant to layer together. And this class is just a third specifier um, whose main purpose, not only is it to be to, to show that it's different from a define or an over, but these class primitives also aren't normally traversed. And so any traversal of a stage uh, should ignore these. So it can kind of, it can keep them from being traversed independently from the, the primitives or the models that might be using them uh, when, when uh, USD composes the scene. One last uh, tidbit that, um, that is good to keep in mind when building USD assets is uh, scopes. So a lot of primitives by default will get created as X forms. Um, but if you've got primitives that are just organizational, they aren't meant to be um, transformed in any way, then it's a good idea to make them scopes. And this, this gives you less work for USD to deal with because it's not managing a transform hierarchy. It also reduces accidental transforms. Um, you don't want artists uh, to accidentally transform these uh primitives and either not see their effect or it visually looks like they've got what they want, but then you've got uh, opinions authored in weird places. So by using scopes, we can avoid um, uh, or largely avoid uh, accidental transforms on child primitives and keep them only on the roots. This is important because if the primitive is, uh, if the reference is instanceable, then those transforms will only work and only take effect if they live on the top primitive. So this is this is an example of of how you would start you know set up the scaffolding to start exploring a different uh, workflow a different uh, uh, asset structure um, but within uh, while using the uh, component output just to, for convenience uh, again you may want to replace this entirely at some point but you don't necessarily have to just right out of the gate so this concludes our workshop uh, on USD assets and the component builder uh, new for Houdini nineteen uh, hopefully. This has, this overview um, has pulled back the curtains a little bit on what the component builder is doing. Uh, maybe it's your first time hearing about it, and so you're you're going to check it out. Uh, but USD is still new. Uh, we hope we hope it's it's useful for everybody, regardless of your comfort level with with USD uh, details. Um, and our hope also is that this tool can um, also be a good launching point into understanding and seeing.
uh, some of the features and principles of USD uh, apply to a to a to an asset structure, um, so that you might uh, feel more confident when you start exploring uh, your own asset structures for a given workflow or pipeline uh, in the future. Uh, thank you so much for your time, and we'll see you later.